Good morning. My name is Eric Rabel. I'm an editor with Top Wire News. Um, and today we are speaking with Dr. Alex Spiropoulos. Um, he's a professor of medicine at the Donald and Barbara Zucker School of Medicine uh, at Hofstra. Also a professor uh, at the Institute of Health and Innovations and Outcomes and Research, Feinstein Institutes uh, for Medical Research, and the director of anticoagulation and clinical thrombosis services at Northwell Health. Uh, Dr. Spiropoulos, thanks for taking the time to speak with us this morning. Thanks for having me, Eric. No problem. Um, so my first question um, is, what do you think um, the latest interesting news in VTE uh, prevention is? In your yeah, so I think uh, there's there's two avenues that that represent I think exciting lines of research. Uh, the first one is an understanding a, a deeper pathophysiology of the mechanisms of thrombosis, specifically pulmonary embolism, um, especially now with the COVID crisis. So COVID has taught us uh, about the potential for uh, brand new mechanisms, or at least uh, previously poorly understood mechanisms of in situ thrombosis. Uh, so this, this concept of thromboinflammation and this concept of um, alveolar in, involvement, endothelial dysfunction and activation of both what we call the uh, complement system, inflammatory system, uh, and cytokine system, creating a, a cytokine storm and, and hyperinflammatory uh, state as a cause of what we call in situ thrombosis and thromboinflammation. That's, uh, again, presenting a, a really a brand new and very interesting pathway in mechanisms of thrombosis that were at least poorly understood before, and now we're getting a, a greater understanding of it. So that's the first part of, 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 of my answer to you. And of course, the second part is in the potential for uh, a brand new class of agents, namely contact pathway inhibitors, such as factor 11A inhibitors, uh, to, uh, to treat patients with thrombotic disorders. And uh, if one is to believe the early data, uh, these new agents may, in, in, in fact, not alter uh, hemostasis, but prevent thrombosis. So this represents a new class of agents that is currently being studied in, in phase two trials. So I think these represent um, brand new, exciting, both mechanisms and, and uh, management and treatment paradigms in, in venous thromboembolic disease. Okay, fantastic. Um, my second question is, um, are you aware of the recent um, CMS eCQM VTE1 and VTE2 CMS updates? And there's a mouthful there. Um, and do you have any thoughts on how, uh, if any, they could impact your practice? Yeah, that certainly is a mouthful, isn't it? Um, and, and I think this, this speaks to the fact that both um, measures include uh, rivaroxaban and patrixaban as direct oral anticoagulants for the prevention of VTE in, in hospitalized settings, both in medical ward and ICU settings. Uh, so yes, th this represents, I think, a, a brand new paradigm for, for managing uh, uh, patients at risk of, of VTE in, in hospitals. And what it speaks to is, is the fact that now we have oral alternatives, oral um, uh, direct uh, anticoagulants uh, that could be used in both hospitalized settings, but also in um, post-hospital discharge settings as well. And this represents, in, in, in essence, a brand new workflow for hospital-based physicians, where likely they are not only, patients are not only undergoing VTE restratification and admission, but also have to be VT restratified at hospital discharge as well. And then if, if they're candidates, if they have high enough VTE risk, um, would be considered for post-discharge extended thromboprophylaxis. So this represents a brand new uh, paradigm, especially in hospitalized medically ill patients. Okay, great. Um, question number three. Um, so you may have touched on this in your first question a little bit, but um, has anything excited you uh, in terms of the new potential uh, therapies or guideline recommended uh, preventative treatments for VTE? <clears throat> yes, I, I think the, you know, to be honest, Eric, the guidelines are lagging behind some of the clinical data uh, because the recent guidelines, especially the American Society of Hematology guidelines do not recommend extended thromboprophylaxis for, for medically ill patients. Uh, but what we've seen is very recent data uh, that describe subgroups of high VTE risk and, and, and low bleed risk populations that definitely would benefit from extended thromboprophylaxis. So um, what we've been doing at Northwell is really fine tuning who these subgroups of patients are, 
Uh, we've used a, a validated VTE risk tool called the Improve VTE tool. We've also added an elevated D-dimer, which is very, I think, relevant in the COVID era to identify high VTE risk patients. And by removing five key bleed risk factors, uh, we're able to uh, identify a high VT risk and low bleed risk population uh, that would benefit from extended thromboprophylaxis. And indeed, we are currently um, about to undergo a pragmatic cluster design randomized trial using both uh, a clinical decision support tool such as the improved tool embedded in the uh, EHR workflow, electronic health record workflow, and rivaroxaban as an oral uh, direct anticoagulant or DOAC um, to see if, if uh, we, can, um, uh, we can show effectiveness of such a multimodal approach. So, you know, the, the part of this uh, clustered RCT is to see if we can improve post-discharge VTE outcomes as well as arterial thromboembolic outcomes using this multimodal approach. And I think this will be the first time this would be uh, shown.